to the American Constitution Society's 2021 National Convention. And thank you for joining us for what we hope will be our last virtual convention. I'm Russ Feingold, the uh, president of the American Constitution Society. And before we launch into our programming, so now October, our executive vice president, and I want to take this opportunity to introduce a new initiative that ACS is undertaking. ACS is celebrating its 20th anniversary. We've dedicated this year to focusing on the law and race, including the founding failures of our Constitution. We've used ACS's anniversary to kickstart this work, but today we're actually announcing a much longer term commitment. We've seen a mix of policies and commitments issued by the federal government and states and corporations over the past year with the stated goal of addressing racial oppression. But if we are to dismantle white supremacy, we need a much more concerted reckoning with our country's history and more coordinated and transformative change. This work is part of a broader global reckoning with the history of slavery and colonialism. France, for example, is finally taking steps to more intentionally address its history of colonialism in Algeria. Germany is acknowledging for the first time its history of genocide in Namibia. Any country that is committed to democratic values and principles must reckon with its history, particularly countries that have this legacy and history of slavery and colonialism. As the democracy with the first written constitution, it is imperative that we acknowledge and address the founding failures of that document and our country. We are starting to see concerted efforts to tell the truth about and reckon with our country's history, including the powerful recent focus on the Tulsa race massacre. This truth telling is a prerequisite for identifying the policies and structures that need to be changed to ensure that history does not repeat. In the United States in particular, this history and this work must include a concerted reckoning with our laws and legal system. Racial inequality is rooted in the legal infrastructure of this country, from the drafting of our first laws to the very design of our government. To fully answer the movement for racial justice requires a mechanism and framework that can drive comprehensive transformation of our legal systems and institutions. In this pursuit, Zanel and I are honored to announce the American Constitution Society's support for a truth, racial healing, and transformation commission in the United States. The ideas for truth, racial healing, and transformation do not belong to ACS. We are following the leadership of Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Senator Cory Booker in calling for such a commission, and leaders like Dr. Gail Christopher, who helped give rise to the truth, racial healing, and transformation movement. And of course, to the many activists, organizers, and people of color who have relentlessly called upon this country to recognize and undertake the seismic changes needed to chart a just and equitable future for all. ACS will also lift up the work being done around reparations, including the leadership of Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. So our goal for ACS is to support the initiatives and leadership of these individuals and organizations who have been advancing truth, racial healing, and transformation for years. It's important for the legal community to be active participants in this work across the globe, legal experts and particularly progressive legal organizations have played critical roles in truth and reconciliation commissions, recognizing how intertwined they are with the law. ACS will focus specifically on how our laws and legal systems have been used to sustain and legitimize racial oppression and on supporting transformative legal change. As Congressman Hank Johnson just told me the other day, we must quote, 
extract slavery from the soil, unquote, of this country. And this means dismantling the legal infrastructure born out of slavery and the subsequent attempts to reinvent it through Jim Crow, redlining, voter suppression, the tax code, labor laws, and the litany of other areas where laws have been enacted to, to sustain racial hierarchy. Our existing apparatuses are not sufficient for the tax task at hand. We cannot litigate away white supremacy or rely on institutions that themselves are sometimes intended to sustain it, including the Supreme Court. We need a national commission with the independence, time, and resources necessary to fully catalog the web of laws that must be transformed if we are to dismantle the legal infrastructure of white supremacy. Similarly, unlike a court or a Congress, a commission can and must be designed to maximize meaningful and authentic participation from the communities who have suffered the greatest harms. This includes centering their experiences in reimagining the law in this country. So while we're calling for a commission, our work need not wait until one is established, nor will this work be complete when a commission concludes. Truth, racial healing, and transformation must be ongoing as the size of the challenges we are grappling with defy any sort of one and done initiative. ACS's work on this front has already started with our analysis of the founding failures of the Constitution, but we are looking to do much, much more. So to discuss this, I'm honored to turn to my colleague and our Executive Vice President, Zanel October. Thank you, Russ, and welcome everyone to our 2021 National Convention. As Professor Yearby said at one of our recent events on the founding failures of our Constitution, racism harms us all. We need to work together to work past it. It's not just about the laws and policies. It's about truth and reconciliation. It's about repairing the trauma from it and moving forward together for a better society. We have seen through COVID and environmental harms that we are all going to be harmed if we don't act, end quote. This work, truth, racial healing, and transformation involves all of us. We wanna invite our student and lawyer chapters and all ACS members to join in reckoning with our laws and institutions and in reimagining a legal system that is grounded in racial equality and justice. Our constitution was not written for people of color and it has rarely been interpreted otherwise. The Supreme Court has always been majority white and majority male. For the longest time, it was uniformly both, influencing binding precedents upon this country. Similarly, the vast majority of our laws were drafted without the input of people of color or with their equality as a goal. This remains true with voter suppression continuing to undermine the voices and political influence of people of color. The racial wealth gap today is built upon decades of housing, labor, and tax laws designed to deny wealth to people of color. From redlining neighborhoods to tax laws that disproportionately penalize black marriage. Redlining, housing segregation, and other zoning laws have contributed to environmental racism and the disproportionate impact of climate change, pollution, and industrial waste on communities of color. This carries over to healthcare and health outcome inequalities which were exacerbated by the pandemic. The original entries in our criminal code were laws meticulously crafted to ensnare people of color, replacing the chains of slavery with prison bars. Supreme Court precedent has contributed to police violence by empowering and protecting law enforcement in conducting traffic stops and carrying out the so-called war on drugs. As a country, we must develop a full and accurate historical record of these laws and legal systems that need to be dismantled, rewritten, and reimagined to achieve racial equality and prosperity in this country. This work involves all of us because the impact of unfair laws and institutions harms all of us. The progressive legal community has an opportunity to help drive this work. This includes at the state and local levels. There are already a number of local initiatives underway across the country, reckoning with state and local laws and histories. 
To our ACS chapters, we will be looking to you to bring the progressive legal community to the table where it isn't there already. Moving forward, ACS will be publishing scholarship, engaging with partners, and hosting conversations like the one we'll hear in just a moment. We're encouraging our network of lawyers, judges, legislative scholars, and advocates across the country to participate. We are committed to this work over the long term and look forward to working with all of you to help achieve it. Now, I want to take the time to thank our sponsors, without whom this virtual convention would not be possible. Our board for their tremendous leadership over this past year. Our chapter leaders across the country who represent the best of ACS on the ground. And our staff who have been working tirelessly to organize such compelling panels and networking opportunities. We are excited for the week of programming ahead of us. I hope you will join us for the important conversations we've planned, such as how we can defend our democracy against increasing concentrations of wealth and power, and how we should respond to a judiciary stacked by the last administration with judges hostile to our view of the law. Since Russ and I visited the border in McAllen, Texas recently, we're particularly excited to hear from DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. We also are very much looking forward to hearing from Connecticut Attorney General William Tong, among other fantastic speakers for the week. And don't miss our members of Color Mixer tonight and Speed Networking Thursday, always fun events. I'm now pleased to pass the mic to my fantastic colleague, Lindsay Langhos, a Director of Policy and Program at ACS, who will get us started by introducing our first panel. Thank you so much, Zanel. Um, I believe we have a brief video to show, and then I will be back on to introduce our moderator. This has been a tough year, an unprecedented year for everyone. We are all grieving today. We are grieving the loss of life and the reality that the foundations of our democracy appear shaky at best. The pandemic. COVID-19. The COVID-19. of life and the reality that the this has been a tough year an unprecedented year for everyone we are all grieving today we are grieving the and the reality that the foundations of our democracy appear shaky at best the pandemic COVID 19 the COVID 19 pandemic virtually everything about who has gotten sick and who has not who has gotten effective treatment and who has not these all are the products of the society the virus has encountered and the policies that govern our society gun violence police violence against black and brown people violence against asian american communities Insurrection at the Capitol. The U.S. Code defines insurrection. It was not just a riot. It was an assault on Congress in the middle of the joint session. We are in a moment of tremendous crisis about whether there would be a handover of power. And yet, even in a year defined by isolation and distance, people came together in solidarity on our screens and in the streets to join in a historic and ongoing movement for racial justice. As we look to the year ahead, new challenges already await us. Our mission is to ensure the integrity of our democracy, because it is at its best when every eligible vote can be counted and when every voice can be heard. The Supreme Court is taking up a case that could overturn Roe versus Wade, 
more states are passing legislation to deny transgender identity, dignity, and health. And climate change is an increasing threat to our communities. So many of these challenges call for hard truths about our laws and legal systems and whom they really serve. But we are especially focusing our work in this anniversary year on our Constitution's founding failures when it comes to race and equality in this country and reckoning with our past to create a more just future. The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery and involuntary servitude, but permits involuntary servitude to the extent that it is a punishment for crime. And we have the immediate attempt during Reconstruction to make Black synonymous with criminal. Part of the declarations of racism as a public health crisis, some communities are putting in reparations, right? So Asheville, North Carolina, California, Evanston, and Illinois. It is a time for transformative change. We are lawyers, students, scholars, advocates, elected officials, and voters. Together, Together we will advocate for court reform and insist on a judiciary that reflects the diverse public it serves. We will work to restore our democratic legitimacy and advance civil rights. We will mobilize the legal community in support of a truth, racial healing, and transformation commission to ensure a future that is different from our past. Together, we are the American Constitution Society. Thank you all, and hopefully that came through somewhat okay. Um, it is our last year to apologize for technical awkwardness, but thank you for your patience. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the first panel of our 2020, 20, 2021 National Convention toward a third reconstruction. As ACS joins in the work on truth, racial healing, and transformation, we could not be starting this week with a more relevant or timely subject. I am excited to introduce our moderator uh, to lead the discussion. Adam Serwer. Adam has written for The Atlantic since 2016, focusing on contemporary politics while often viewing it through the lens of history. He, has a he was a Spring Fellow at the Shorenstein Center at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, as well as the Ira Lippman Fellow at the Columbia University School of Journalism, and is the recipient of the 2019 Hillman Prize for Opinion Journalism. His first book, The Cruelty is the Point, Essays on Trump's America, will be released on June 29th. Welcome, Adam. Adam, I think you might be on mute. I said, thank you, Lindsay, and thank you so much for that generous introduction. Uh, I'm just gonna get started uh, introducing our panelists. Uh, Maggie Blackhawk is a professor of law at the New York University School of Law. Uh, she researches and teaches in the fields of constitutional law, federal Indian law, and legislation. Her recent projects examine the ways that American democracy can and should empower minorities, especially outside of traditional rights and courts-based frameworks. She is particularly interested in those formal legal institutions that empower minorities to govern and engage in lawmaking and how those institutions might be harnessed to better mitigate constitutional failures like colonialism and slavery. She is curr currently crafting a book manuscript on the centrality of native nations, native peoples, and American colonialism to the constitutional law and constitutional history of the United States. Blackhawk graduated from UCLA and Stanford Law School. Our second panel panelist is Dorothy A. Brown, the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Law at the Emory University School of Law. Uh, Dorothy is a nationally recognized scholar in tax policy, race, and class, and has published extensively on the racial implications of federal tax policy. She has taught courses in administrative law, critical race theory, federal income tax, and partnership tax, and is the author of The Whiteness of Wealth, How the Tax System Impoverishes Black Americans and How We Can Fix It. Brown is highly sought after for her expertise in workplace inclusion issues, a respected speaker in the legal community, and a regularly engaged expert by media, including Bloomberg, CNN, National Public Radio, The New York Times, National Law Journal, and Forbes. Prior to becoming a professor of law, Brown worked as an advisor to J. Stephen Swift of the U.S. Tax Court, as an associate with Haynes and Miller in Washington, D.C., and as an investment banker at New York's Drexel, Burnham, and Lambert. 
She was also a special assistant to the Federal Housing Commissioner at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Brown is a graduate of Fordham University, Georgetown University Law Center, and New York University School of Law. Catherine Frank is the James L. Dorr Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. Uh, Catherine is among the nation's leading scholars writing on law, race, religion, and rights. She directs the Center for Gender and Sexuality Law at the, uh, and is the faculty director of the Law, Rights, and Religion Project at Columbia Law School. Her most recent book, Repair, Redeeming the Progress, Promise of Abolition, sorry, Repair, Redeeming the Promise of Abolition, makes the case for racial reparations today by telling the story of experiments in South Carolina and Mississippi in the 1860s where freed people were given land explicitly as a reparation for enslavement and then had it taken away by the government. Frank also launched the ERA Project, a law and policy think tank to develop academically rigorous research, policy papers, expert guidance, and strategic leadership on the Equal Rights Amendment, ERA, to the Constitution. She is a graduate of Barnard College, Northeast, Northeastern University School of Law, and Yale Law School. Ian, Laney, Ian Haney Lopez is the Chief Justice Earl Warren Professor of Public Law at the UC Berkeley School of Law. Ian teaches in the areas of race and constitutional law. His current research emphasizes the connection between racial divisions in society and growing wealth equality in the United States. After publishing Dog Whistle Politics, How Coded Racial Appeals Have Reinvented Racism and Wrecked the Middle Class, Haiti Lopez co-chaired the AFL-CIO's Advisory Council on Racial and Economic Justice and then co-founded the Race Class Narrative Project, exploring how to defeat dog whistle politics. His most recent book, Merge Left, Fusing Race and Class, Winning Elections, and Saving America explains how the political manipulation of coded racism has evolved in the Trump era while also offering an evidence-based approach to neutralizing political racism and building cross-racial solidarity. He is a graduate of Washington University, Princeton University, and Harvard Law School. Um, for those seeking uh, continuing legal education credit for our panel, we will post a link in the chat box at the end of the session that will take you to a Google form that you must complete in order to obtain credit. You will be required to provide two codes. I will provide the first code at the midpoint of this panel and the second code at the end. You will need to provide both codes to obtain credit. Okay, so uh, let's get started with the panel. Um, Ian, uh, when we spoke earlier, you said you wanted to take issue with the premise of the panel uh, regarding a third reconstruction. And I was wondering if you could elaborate for us on your objection. Sure, delighted to do so. I, I think there's two objections. One is the generic. Um, it's highly optimistic to talk about a third reconstruction. I, I think a better framing for the moment is we're in the fight for our lives to save our democracy from sliding into authoritarianism. Um, this is a moment in which um, um, so much is at stake in terms of our democracy. Um, uh, now, a third reconstruction and also the slide to authoritarianism, they're related, and they're related to this other dynamic, which is the one I wanna focus on. Um, what happens when we think about racism in the way that this panel has been framed? Um, panel's been framed partly as how do we get past white supremacy? How do we dis dismantle white supremacy? Uh, I want to uh, quote a little bit from the language that was used in describing this panel. It says, with white nationalists storming the Capitol and racially motivated violent extremism on the rise, COVID-19 ravaging communities of color and police officers continuing to kill black people without penalty, the past here has illuminated the myriad ways in which racism permeates every corner of our society. What lessons can we learn from our own previous attempts to redress wrongs done to racial communities? I want to call this the white racism frame. And I want to suggest first that the white racism frame actually impedes our ability to create conditions of racial justice for communities of color. I want to suggest that there's a more potent, more radical frame available to us, a weaponized racism frame. I want to insist that the weaponized racism frame is a, not a colorblind frame, though it is a frame that identifies the centrality of the connection between racism and class war. 
And finally, I want to suggest that this weaponized racism frame has the emancipatory potential that a white racism frame not only lacks, but actually imperils. Okay, so that's the talk. Listen, what's the deal with a white racism frame? A white racism frame says the fundamental problem we face is racism from whites that hurts people of color. And it implies that the solution to racism is help for people of color. And within this narrative, racism is something that hurts people of color and it's something that does not hurt white people um, uh, at best or at worst, it's the fault of white people. Um, and I think that Zanel October in her, in her opening remarks here actually pointed towards another frame, a frame that says, no, no, this is really about all of us. Racism isn't, <clears throat> pardon me, racism isn't, isn't hurting us all in the same way, but we are all the victims of racism. How can that be? I'm reminded of the early conversation urged upon us by Barbara Fields, who said, don't think about white racism. Don't explain white racism by reference to white racism alone. Don't explain a social construction in terms of that which is socially constructed. Look to the larger dynamics. When she wrote that several decades ago, she was talking about the rise of slavery and genocide and the dispossession of Native Americans. But it's actually a caution that applies equally well to what's happened to our country since the civil rights movement. Since the civil rights movement, or starting in the midst of the civil rights movement in 1964, the party formerly known as the party of big business recognized that if it wanted to lead a war against activist liberal government, against Lyndon Johnson and his promise of a war on poverty, it could not successfully do so through the language of economic royalism but it could successfully do so through a coded language of racial resentment. And this is the inception of dog whistle politics. People began to talk about it as the Southern strategy, as if this were only gonna be effective in the South. But when Richard Nixon won in a national landslide in 1972, it was clear that racial resentment could be harnessed nationally as a way of remaking the party of big business into the party, into a populist party that presented itself as defenders of the white working class. That, so, okay, so that, and there's sort of, with fits and starts, there's a direct continuity between 1964, 1972, Reagan in 1980, all the way up to Donald Trump. What are the main hallmarks of that dynamic? Three things, one, the GOP itself has been transmogrified. There's a feedback loop. Once the party decided upon racial demagoguery as its primary strategy, that uh, shaped the expectations of the base and in turn shaped each new generation of political leaders. And now we have a party that is no longer committed to democracy because almost all of its members have been elected through appeals to racial demagoguery and to cultural politics more generally. Hence the connection, not just between attacks on Black Lives Matter, but the greatest number of attacks we've seen in decades on abortion and in defense of patriarchy, and also renewed onslaught of attacks against trans rights and other LGBTQ uh, issues. This is cultural war politics remaking the Republican Party. Second major dynamic, a class war that the rich have been winning for decades so much so that we see levels of wealth inequality now that we haven't seen since the Gilded Era. How have they won that class war? And by the way, when I say class war, I mean it in the Warren Buffett sense, right? Not the, not the you know, Hugo Chavez sense, but in the Warren Buffett, there's a class war all right in my side's winning sense. How do they win? Through shattering social solidarity, by convincing people to fear their neighbors rather than economic elites. That's the second major uh, uh, um, uh, dynamic. What's the third? Decades of systematic war against communities of color through things like racialized mass incarceration and racialized mass deportation. Why those dynamics? That isn't white racism in general. It's dog whistle politics in particular. It's political leaders campaigning on scare stories who then govern through a theater of racial fear the reality of which, the, the, the policy reality, reality of which, 
is massive violence against communities of color. That's the first part of my talk in which I wanna say, hey, listen, this white racism frame, it's analytically flawed. It's, it's blinding us to the role of class war and culture war politics in generating heightened levels of violent against, violence against communities of color race and racial conflict and also to the reality of a class war all of us are losing. That's the first part. Here's the second part. This one will be a little bit briefer. When we use a white racism frame, we actually impede progress towards racial justice and also accelerate the slide towards authoritarianism. And this is a huge claim. And I think it's one that should, that will and should prompt significant pushback. I am saying to the community from which I'm coming, the racial justice folks, watch out. The way we're talking about white racism is actually imperiling our ability to achieve racial justice for our communities and accelerating the slide towards authoritarianism. Why? Because it amplifies the right's story. Since 1964, the right has been saying, hey, America, you have a you, we, are, we are a country that is fundamentally locked into racial conflict. Everybody needs to choose a racial side, stand with good, decent, hardworking, tax-paying people against those dangerous, law-abiding, tax-cheat, welfare queen, gangbanger, terrorist, illegals. We understand that that's a racialized narrative. If the left responds by saying, hey, America, we are indeed locked into a fundamental racial conflict. White racism is the enemy. Everybody needs to choose a side, stand with communities of color. It's the same damn story. We're locked into racial conflict. Everybody needs to choose a side. We amplify the right story. And we should be super clear, if that's our message, if our message is we need to stand with people of color against white racism, we will lose significant, we will lose the majority of whites. What also should be clear after 2020 is we're gonna lose significant numbers of people of color. I've been doing research in this field, focus groups, polling for the last five years. Um, people of color, not the activists, but in our community, people are made really nervous by a story that says white racism and a, and a, and a political party beloved by millions of racist whites, that's the problem we face. You also see the results in the 2020 election where almost one in three Latinos voted for Donald Trump. Support for Donald Trump went up among African-Americans 2020 compared to 2016. The left is telling a story of racial conflict and it's actually helping the right. Is there a solution? Yeah, and what is that solution? Shift from a white racism frame to a weaponized racism frame. One thing I wanna insist on really clearly here, by adding class, I am not shifting to color blindness, and I am not um, decentering racism. We must keep racism front and center as the gravest threat that any of us face. But we must reframe racism from thinking about it primarily as white racism to understanding it fundamentally as driven by weaponized racism. Racism as a strategy of some of the most powerful actors in our society. This is not my idea alone. I think this is the, 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 the radical insight driving Bacon's rebellion, the sort of linkage of uh, um, uh, 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 poor whites and African-Americans in the early years of the rise of slavery. It's the insight animating the fusion movement right after the Civil War, linking poor blacks um, and poor whites together in the South. It's the insight of Fred Hampton and of Martin Luther King, of Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. I think it's the insight of the new poor people's movement, the most radical thing, and frankly, the most potent thing, the most powerful, the most convincing thing we can do right now is insist on building power together with others on the basis of cross-racial solidarity, or more generally, on the basis of social solidarity. We on the left have been um, uh, sort of acculturated to arguing for power for each of our communities in silos. And yet the main strategy of the, of the powerful in our society is to win by pushing all of us into different silos and convincing us that we're in competition with each other. Really, 
the only route forward is a, a sort of concerted, comprehensive commitment to social solidarity and building power together, not by obscuring the hierarchies that are used to divide us, but by committing to center those as something each and every one of us has to overcome in order to build power with people who look different than us, who came at a different time, who have a different legal status, who have a different religion or sexual orientation, we can only take care of our own families and save our democracy when we build power across these silos, not within them. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Ian. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, I I'm going to move on to Dorothy. Uh, so I, this phrase, systemic racism, is everywhere now. Um, what is it? What does the term actually mean, and 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 what does it have to do with the third reconstruction? Thank you, Adam, for that question. When I talk about racial inequality being systemic, what do I mean? I mean that the laws or systems in place operate in reality to disadvantage a particular group because of their race. The racial inequality does not have to be explicit. In fact, if it were explicit, it would be illegal. But just because the law as written is colorblind does not mean the law in practice is colorblind. Take tax law, which is my area of expertise. While it is illegal to pass a law that explicitly says black Americans are required to pay higher taxes than white Americans, our tax system operates in precisely that way. So now let me tell you a story. I went into tax law to get away from race. I was born and raised in the South Bronx and dealt with racism all my life. I remember being around nine or 10 years old and I was at the corner with my mother and there was a police car making a right turn. We were waiting for the light to change. And I saw in the back of the police car, a black man who was handcuffed and a white cop sitting next to him beating him. And I looked in horror and I turned to my mother to see if she was seeing what I was seeing. And in a really low voice, she said, that happens sometimes. Now, let me explain something about my mother. She did not take racism lying down. When we were in a store and a white person came in behind us and went to the front of the line, my mother made it clear that we were here first. And as I describe it, she did not use her inside voice. So my mother was not used to taking things lying down. But when she said it happened sometimes, it made me realize there was nothing we could do about it. And I stared at the man in the black in the back of the car until and our eyes met and the car turned, the police car turned and I stared at him until he was out of sight. And that that feeling of helplessness, helplessness never went away. So I decided to be a lawyer, but I didn't want to be a lawyer dealing with an area of law that had anything to do with race. That was my personal life, and I didn't want my professional life um, to, to implicate that. So I go to college. I major in accounting in case the law thing doesn't work out. Accounting will be able to help me uh, make a living. And I take a tax accounting course, and I go, that's it. I want to be a tax lawyer. Why? Because I know the only color that matters is green. So this is perfect. I love math. It's accounting. I'm good. Fast forward, I'm a law professor. And one of the best things about being a law professor is you, you kind of have a lot of control over your schedule. So one particular day, oh, another thing law professors like to do is procrastinate. So this particular day, instead of preparing for class, I read an article that I'd been saving. And it was an article written by the late Jerome Culp, who was then a law professor at Duke and a mentor of mine. And he made it, he wrote an article called Toward Developing a Black Legal Scholarship. And the article argued for black law professors to look at systemic racism in their area of law to see if there was some racially disparate impact. So I am reading the article and I'm convinced it has nothing to do with me. This is just gonna be a nice little diversion. About two pages from the end, he says, or he writes, how do you know there isn't a race and tax problem if you don't look? And I went, what? 
race and tax? Uh, uh, Jerome is brilliant, so I, I, okay, I'm gonna give this a shot. So I pick up the phone and I call him. I say, I don't know what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do something. Well, that's kind of when the problem began because what I found out is the IRS does not publish statistics by race. So how on earth am I ever going to figure out if there is this systemic racism in our tax laws? So as a result, I had to become a bit of a detective. I would read anything about race I could get my hands on and I would put my tax lenses on. And I read this report by the US Commission on Civil Rights and there was a line in the report that said, married black wives contribute roughly 40% to household income and married white wives contribute 29%. Now to those of you in the audience, you're like, huh, what? But to me, it was tax gold because that sentence told me that when black people got married, the tax implications were different from when white people got married. So let me explain. We have this thing called the joint return. And as a result, married couples can file an one return for both partners. If you contribute household income a certain way, if the spouses contribute income to the household a certain way, they get a tax cut. If they contribute income a different way, they get no tax cut and potentially pay higher taxes. So what that article showed me was basically a connection to my own family because being the tax attorney and a good daughter, I did my parents' tax returns. And every year I did my return, I did their return, I was making by myself what they were making combined. I should have been paying a lot more taxes than they were because we have a progressive tax system that says in theory, as your income goes up, your tax rate dramatically goes up. So I was paying more, but not a lot more. And I always, had the feeling that my parents were paying too much in taxes, but I was doing everything right and I couldn't figure out why. Well, when I came across this statistic, I started to unravel the mystery of my parents' tax returns. My mother was a nurse, my father was a plumber, and they earned roughly equal amounts. So the income split was 50-50. At the time, they were paying higher taxes when they got married. So their tax bill went up. If, for example, my father, and it was uh, in terms of dollar, it was $70,000 combined. So it was 35,000 for my mother, 35,000 for my father. If, however, my father had been able to get a job where he earned $70,000 and my mother would have been a stay-at-home spouse, they would have got a tax cut when they got married. Well, surprise, surprise, I looked at Census Bureau data because remember, I can't go to the statistics of income at the IRS, they don't publish it by race. So I had an analysis done. I looked at Census Bureau data and, sh and the data showed when white couples got married, they were more likely to be in the 100 zero category, which meant when they got married, they were getting a tax cut. But when Black couples got married, they were more likely to be in the 50-50 category and their taxes went up. So fast forward to the Trump tax cuts. The Trump tax cuts significantly decreased the marriage penalty, at which point the audience is saying, huh, what? I say the Trump tax cuts were not designed to help married black couples. But white supremacy always sweeps up a category of white Americans. And in fact, the marriage penalty was sweeping in a significant minority of white married couples. Over time, more and more white married couples started looking like black married couples with this 50-50 income split. As they started paying a higher penalty, I think that was the impetus for the Trump tax cuts to minimize the marriage penalty. But he didn't eliminate it. 
married couples who were eligible for the earned income tax credit, which is a tax credit for low income wage earners, are hit significantly hard by the marriage penalty. The Trump tax cuts did nothing on that end. And the Trump tax cuts did nothing at the high end. And what we see at the high end, when I say high end, $500,000, $600,000 household income or higher, at that level, yes, it's true, there are a higher percentage of white couples than black couples, but for the black couples in those high income households, their taxes are going up. The Trump tax cuts did nothing to minimize that marriage penalty, whereas white married couples at the high income levels are still getting a marriage bonus. They get a tax cut when they get married. Okay, so that's one example of how systemic racism embedded in a colorblind tax system called the joint return impacts negatively black Americans while giving tax subsidies to white Americans. The other example I wanna give is home ownership. Most people know there's this thing called the mortgage interest deduction. If you buy a home and you have a mortgage, you get an interest break. But with the 2017 Tax Act, what we see is only one in 10 Americans right now itemize deductions. And you can't get the benefit of the mortgage interest deduction if you don't itemize your deductions. What do I mean by that? Well, everybody, get, every taxpayer gets a choice. They can reduce their taxable income by something called the standard deduction, which is a function of your status, single married head of household, or you can reduce your taxable income by all of the deductions you have paid over the year that Congress says is allowable. Whichever of those two amounts is higher is the one you take. For 90% of Americans, the standard deduction is the higher amount, so they take the standard deduction, which means only one in 10 Americans can benefit from the mortgage interest deduction. And surprise, surprise, that one in 10 skews higher income. So the mortgage interest deduction isn't really uh, that big deal. However, there's a tax subsidy for gain on the sale of your home. So let's say you have a home and you pay $100,000 for it and you hold it and over time it appreciates. And let's say you sell it for $150,000. That $50,000 difference between what you pay and what you sell is gain. It would be taxable except Congress says you can receive it tax-free. In fact, Congress says if you're married, you can receive up to half a million dollars of gain on the sale of your residence, your, your home. If you're single, you can receive up to $250,000. Okay, well, yes, it's true that 74% of white Americans own homes and 47 or 48% of black Americans own homes. So yes, it's true. White Americans are more likely to be homeowners and therefore more likely to benefit from this tax subsidy. That's not the worst part. The worst part, and another example of systemic racism, is our tax laws subsidize white homeowners while at the same time disadvantaging black homeowners. How can this be? Well, where is all this homeownership gain? Do black homeowners have an equal opportunity to get as much gain as white homeowners in the United States of America? Uh, no. Why? Because we live in segregated areas. Black homeowners are more likely to live in all black or racially diverse neighborhoods. White homeowners are more likely to live in homogeneous all white or virtually all white, very few black neighbors. The most appreciation is in the all white or mostly all white neighborhoods. Less appreciation is found in all black or racially diverse neighborhoods. So when black homeowners sell, they're more likely if they have a gain to have a significantly lower gain than white homeowners. But it gets worse because there's another part of the tax story. 
I said, when you sell a home at a gain, you can get up to half a million dollars tax free. If you sell your home at a loss, there is no tax break for you. So we can contrast this briefly with if I sell stock at a loss, I get tax, I get some tax subsidies. If I sell a home at a loss, there's no tax subsidy. What a surprise. Black homeowners, as well as other homeowners who live in all black or racially diverse neighborhoods, are more likely to sell their home at a loss. So the neutral tax rule that says no homeowner can get a loss on their tax return disadvantages Black homeowners because we are the ones most likely to sell our homes for a loss. So there are other examples I talk about in my book, The Whiteness of Wealth, but I just wanted to key on a couple of them, marriage and home ownership, to to bring it back to this concept of systemic racism. There is nothing in the tax law that says gain from the sale is tax-free if you're white. There's nothing in the tax law that says if you take, if you cannot take a loss, if you're black, which leads people to believe our tax laws are colorblind and neutral and objective. In fact, I get a lot of pushback. I've been writing about race and tax for literally 25 years. So the whiteness of wealth is the culmination of 25 years of, of research. And when I started talking to academics, the first response I got was, oh, Dorothy, in fact, I'm going to quote. Dorothy, everybody knows your work is irrelevant because Blacks are poor and don't pay a lot in taxes. So that was a tax law professor in the Q&A at an annual national law professor conference. And the first question was directed at me. That's what I got, right? So I'm used to the pushback, which basically caused me to analyze systemic racism across the income spectrum. So Black married couples, whether they're low income, medium income, high income, are likely to pay higher taxes when they get married. Black homeowners, wealthy Black homeowners, are still more likely to, to not have as much gain as their white peers. So the systemic racism in the tax law that the IRS's policy decision to not provide data reinforces the notion that it's colorblind. Well, I mean, we don't even collect it. So how could it be racist? When you look at audit rates, ProPublica has done research that shows a, a disproportionate percentage of audits are earned income tax credit, low income workers in the rural South. The South is where most Black people live. So the fact that the IRS doesn't have statistics on who they audit hasn't stopped the IRS from somehow managing to disproportionately audit Black people, right? Or as I like to say, racism and specifically systemic racism always finds a way. So when I think about solutions to how can we reform tax policy to fix this? My solution is to get rid of these loopholes, get rid of these exclusions, get rid of these tax breaks that, if you'll see in my book, were designed by rich white Americans to figure out a way to lower their tax bill, and they brought Congress along. We saw that in the joint return. It was Henry and Charlotte Seaborn in 1927, one of the few in 1927, only rich people pay taxes. So they were one of the few Americans paying taxes. And they said, you know what? I don't like this. So they went with their lawyers. They filed what I would say is a fraudulent return. They made up a deduction. The IRS said you can't do it. They took it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, oh, yeah, you can do it. Fast forward, we get a joint return. So, and the homeownership exclusion from gain on the sale, that came in because of the defense industry needed white workers to move from one part of the country in the 1950s to another. And they had 
increased their home ownership rate. So by 1950, it was the first time a majority of white Americans became homeowners. So surprise, 1951, we get a tax break when you sell your home and you want to move across the country to take one of the defense jobs. So I found systemic racism in the tax laws, not by reading the statute, but by applying the statute in our very racialized society. I'll end it there. Uh, thank you so much. That was great. Uh, it, and such a compelling story about how uh, racism pulls people in, even when you, you actually don't want to have your professional life to have anything to do with it. All right, we're gonna move on to Catherine. Uh, thank you for being here, Catherine. Uh, you had some thoughts on the role of the Constitution and the courts in a potential new reconstruction. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you have in mind? I can, Adam. Thank you so much. I just want to thank President Feingold and the ACS for inviting me to be part of this really dynamic and fabulous conversation. It's wonderful to be sharing a virtual stage with this uh, this wonderful group. So, um, uh, if, when we're thinking about uh, tiers of reconstruction, the first, second, and the third, really since the second reconstruction in the 1860s, I think the left has largely worked, or 1960s, sorry, the, la the left has largely worked on defense. We've been on our heels in many respects, defending the gains of the various civil rights laws that were passed or enacted during that time has largely been our work. This entailed building a public and private infrastructure to enforce race-based discrimination laws, relying on an identity-based uh, form of justice that delegated enormous power to federal courts to define what both the meaning of racial bias was and how it should be remedied. Now, while many of the social movements that motivated the passage of the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s were quite radical, the implementation of the legislative gains from that time, in my view, have been relatively mainstream, if not, in many cases, conservative in nature. The second reconstruction has proven relatively ineffective at both naming and addressing systemic forms of inequality. And I would imagine all of us on this panel would agree about that. <coughs> Sadly, Alan Freeman's critique of this civil rights paradigm as embracing a perpetrator's perspective is even more true today than it was when he first offered this analysis in 1978. Federal courts have entrenched a narrow definition of what counts as racism or racialized harm, the identification of individual actors whose conduct was motivated by explicit, explicit racial animus is that paradigm. And it has the effect of normalizing, if not legitimizing, white supremacy. While the legal left has reluctantly, I think, collaborated in producing this meager paradigm of racial justice, the right, by contrast, has mobilized fiercely and unrelentingly to dismantle and or undermine meaningful racial justice measures. I think it's hard to deny that we've been outplayed and outmaneuvered. The decision two weeks ago from the Sixth Circuit is a great example, Vitolo versus uh, Guzman. It perfectly captures the ha hollowness of the current concept of racial equality that we have fought for and been awarded under the Equal Protection Clause. This guy, Antonio Vitolo, a white male owner of Jake's Bar and Grill in Harriman, Tennessee, challenged the fast track application procedure that was built into the COVID stimulus bill. It was designed to give restaurants owned by women and people of color priority in receiving stimulus checks. It's not that white men didn't get stimulus checks also, but that restaurants that were owned by women and people of color were first in line. Vitolo claimed that the policy discriminated against him as a white man. There was overwhelming evidence introduced in the trial court that businesses owned by women and people of color were much more vulnerable to economic distress than those owned by white entre entrepreneurs. I mean, we all know this by looking out the window in our own communities. Nevertheless, the court found that the government had neither an important nor compelling interest in fast tracking checks 
to those business owners that were hardest hit by COVID. And doing so amounted to race and sex discrimination against Mr. Vitolo. That is what the Equal Protection Clause stands for now, the rights of white men. So if this is the state of our racial equality paradigm, do we need to advocate for a third reconstruction? Some say we'd surely do, but in some, sex, in some respects, I would say absolutely, and I'm also inclined to return to the first reconstruction as unfinished business. We can't chart a forward-looking reconstruction of our race-based um, jurisprudence and forms of justice in this country without incorporating a backward-looking responsibility and obligation to the inter intergenerational afterlife of slavery. To my mind, slavery is not merely a shameful and now repudiated historical fact, horror, that figures in a complex national narrative of race. Rather, the enslavement of millions of black people in this country is sui generis. It is a founding atrocity that was embraced, promoted, and defended by the architects of the nation that's, and it structured the US Constitution, our economy, and our legal institutions. Maggie Blackhawk teaches us, and we'll talk shortly, I'm sure, about how the same could be said for the atrocities committed against Native people in North America as well. These two founding forms of horrendous violence and dispossession of land and of human dignity, again, are not just facts to lock in history, but have to animate not only how we understand ourselves as a country, but what it means for racial justice paradigms going forward. So what kind of moral demands does this particular racial past continue to make on us today? How does the relegation of slavery to a past, a disavowed past that we hear from the likes of Mitch McConnell that are disconnected to contemporary struggles for racial justice, what kind of effect do they have on perpetuating white innocence? How do we reckon with the fact that some of these ruptures, whether it's to black people or native people in this country and in our past, are actually not fully repairable? After all, we remember Oedipus does not get his eyes back. And slavery and the dispossession and genocides committed towards native people I believe are those kinds of ruptures. They're not fully repairable, yet the moral demands they continue to make on us today remain fundamental to building the ongoing project of a more just society. To go back to the opening remarks that set up the panel today, I don't think we can fully extract slavery from our soil. It will always be a fundamental part of the land on which we, on which we stand. Um, as was, of course, the dispossession of Native people. But just as freedom is a constant struggle, I think so too, the project of facing and engaging our past must be an ongoing evolution, not a resolution through particular legal measures. So in my book, Repair, Redeeming the Promise of Abolition, I argue that we must undertake today some kind of repair, not perfect repair, but a moral kind of repair of the atrocity of slavery, even if incomplete, and that the failure to do so has been the enabling condition for our contemporary civil rights laws at adoption of a perpetrator's perspective that in many respects has done more to redeem white innocence than dismantle structures of white supremacy in this country. The book walks through two examples of where repair was undertaken in the immediate post-Civil War period, actually some of them during the war itself. And I think they provide an important uh, set of examples for us today. Reparations is not a modern notion. The term reparations was actually used by freed people, freed black people at the time in the 1860s and by white Northern military officials and politicians in DC as a mandatory component of what it meant to move beyond slavery and this, a, a, a society structured around slavery. So as an example, in 1861, July of 1861, as the Northern troops moved through, through the Sea Islands 
in South Carolina and occupied those sea islands, um, they encountered 10 to 15,000 black people who were enslaved there. The very presence of those white soldiers accomplished the legal and social emancipation of the enslaved people of the Sea Islands. One of the first things that the military officials did was ask those people, those black people, what do you want? What does freedom mean to you? Not just the end of the institution of slavery, but something more we suspect. And oddly enough, they listened. And what they were told is that we wanna build new lives away from white people. Any kind of freedom or uh, any kind of measures that don't take land into account are meaningless to us. One man said, what is the use of giving us freedom if we have no place of our own? So the idea of land is security. The idea that land, the reapportionment of land, when we now talk about 40 acres and a mule um, as something, uh, almost as a trope, um, but at the time, it was more than 40 acres and more than mules that people demanded and it, wildly enough, they got. There was a rich understanding of, by the military officials who were charged with the, the project, the humanitarian project of shepherding formerly enslaved people towards lives that were more free, that land was necessary, not only in a backward looking sense of repairing the horror, the indignity, the murder, the family separation, the rape of enslavement, of course also the theft of labor, but all of that, but also land and a safe place to live to rebuild communities and lives was necessary as a forward looking measure. One could not be free without material resources. A community could not rebuild as free people without a place they could call their own. So just as this was going on, Congress was doing something quite similar through the Homestead Act, giving away huge tracts of land in the West to white people. 1.5 million white families were awarded large tracts of land in the West that if they worked that land for a few years, they were basically awarded it for free. 246 million acres 10% of the United States land altogether at that time was given through the Homestead Act to white families. Small amounts of land were being allocated to freed people in the South during this small window um, uh, at the end or close to the end of the Civil War. And then as soon as Lincoln is assassinated, Andrew Johnson becomes president, all of that land was returned to the former slave owners uh, and the free people of the Sea Islands were forced to enter into year-long co labor contracts with the people who enslaved them before. That's what it meant to be freed, but not free. That's what reparations could have been and weren't. A new form of um, slavery by another name, of unfreedom by another name was put in place in the name of the property interests of white enslavers. Um, now there's a horrible tragedy, also a tragic story to be told, of course, of whose land was being given away by the federal government through the Homestead Act, who was being dispossessed there. But in both of these situations, a form of justice was possible through land security. Um, uh, and instead it was white people who were awarded land. Um, and today we wonder why there was some, there's such a broad uh, racial wealth gap in this country and land ownership plays such an important role in this. So three quick points just to take from this story in terms of our contemporary considerations of truth, racial heal healing, and transformation, which is the ACS's wonderful commitment um, going forward announced today. The first is that there's no necessary relationship between emancipation and freedom. You can end the institution of slavery formally and legally and people are still not free, right? More than ending that institution was required to create a free population of black people in this country. The second 
I believe this story tells us, and this is not the only place in the Sea Islands, is that reparations have to be undertaken not only as a remedy for slavery and an important remedy for slavery, but as the necessary condition for contemporary black freedom. And it's understanding the relationship between reparations, not only in slavery, but black freedom today that may help us shape what those reparations should look like. And the third is the idea that black people need a place. In this country, I don't believe that black people have ever had a place other than on the plantation or in prison. That's where they have belonged as a social matter. And the structures that we've created in this country have made that the case. So in my view, what we should do is reparations at a minimum through the allocation of land in community land trusts is what I recommend in the book, not individual checks, but community land trusts that build power in communities, don't just build riches in those communities, but we'll do both. And to go back to where Professor Brown took us before, and boy, do I wish you'd been my tax professor. <laughs> it was a very different lecture than what I got in law school and that I think is going on in the tax classrooms at Columbia Law School today. Um, we are in the midst of the largest intergenerational transfer of wealth that we have ever seen on this planet. Raise the damn estate tax. Put that money into a trust that can work with reparations for native people and reparations for black people in this country. Um, we have the resources to do it. We have the tools to do it. Um, and we should think of reparations about building power and freedom, not just handing out checks. Um, and a lot more to say about that. And I know that's a very controversial claim, even in the reparations world, but that's where I end um, in my book. And that's where I'm going to end right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine, for that really compelling history lesson and also that cold water on the role of uh, the courts uh, in enforcing civil rights. Um, I'm going to introduce our last panelist, but first I have to make uh, an announcement regarding um, continuing legal education credit. Uh, for those seeking CLE credit, the first code for today's panel is Equality 12, which you can also find displayed at the bottom of the screen. As a reminder, you'll need this code and the code I'll provide at the end of the panel to qualify for CLE credit. Um, and our, uh, I'm moving on to our last speaker, Maggie. Uh, Maggie, how, how do Native Americans figure in past reconstructions or not? And how should a hypothetical third reconstruction be handled differently uh, from the point of view of, of Native people? Oh, thank you so much for that question. And I, I think I'm actually really grateful to follow Professor Frinke because she keyed me up quite well in the discussion that I'd like to have um, uh, about ways to broaden the lens of the uh, panel's focus on a third reconstruction to reflect other forms of state-sponsored violence, subordination, and constitutional failure. Um, so given the, the deep roots that the original sin of human slavery has had within this country, it of course makes sense to center that sin in efforts to repair our democratic and constitutional framework in the future. And my remarks today are in no way intended to decenter reconstruction. Rather, I hope to broaden our vision to include other original sins, like that of American colonialism and the violent dispossession of native peoples and native nations of their culture, sovereignty, and even children. My hope is that a broader vision of racial injustice, one that also includes xenophobic policies against Asian and Latinx communities, as well as many other instances of injustice toward racialized peoples could add nuance and perhaps even unsettle those presumptions that we hold about how best to resolve issues of racism and subordination. It could also add to our toolkit of potential solutions to be drawn upon in crafting uh, and shaping um, a so-called third reconstruction. So I'd like to begin uh, with the first reconstruction and what a broader view of that history can teach us. Um, a broader view of this period is one that focuses not just on the American South and efforts to empower individuals who had been enslaved, but a view that also incorporates events in the West and Professor Frinke um, so nicely uh, keyed these up uh, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. <clears throat> 
The simple story we often tell in law schools about reconstruction, mostly in 1L classes in constitutional law, which I am guilty of teaching myself, is that the intervention of the federal government to enforce newly codified rights in the United States Constitution offered liberation for African Americans. We speculate that Reconstruction failed for myriad reasons, uh, but we primarily focus on the retreat of the national government from the South and its failure to enforce those constitutional rights through the courts or otherwise. The lessons that we draw from this simple story continue to animate our views of federalism, for example. The original sin of human slavery has taught us that if there is too much power in the states and not enough limitation on state power in the form of, a nas of national power or rights, then America might again reenact similar atrocities. A third reconstruction grounded on a simple story could presume, um, as does much of our constitutional theory, that minorities are best protected with national oversight, rights-based frameworks, and judicial solicitude. Although there's much to learn from the United States' tragic history with slavery and Jim Crow segregation, this nation's tragic history of colonialism offers contrasting lessons about our constitutional framework, uh, even during the same period of history. So Reconstruction is often periodized from circa 1863 to 1877, the same period in Native history is known as the, quote, reservation era. In contrast to the national government's claims that it was too weak to intervene in the lives of African Americans in the West, sorry, African Americans, in the West, the national government was strong enough to build detention camps on reservations, wherein the national government governed every single facet of Native lives, including criminalizing political practice, religious devotion, the structure of Native families, and by forcing Native children into government-run or funded boarding schools where they would, quote, kill the Indian in him to save the man. In contrast to our simple story of reconstruction, the intervention of national power into the lives of Native people in the late 19th century actually furthered majority tyranny. The history of Indian country similarly unsettles the simple story we tell about the benefits of national constitutional rights for minority subordination. By contrast to other minority communities, rights are feared in Indian country rather than sought. In fact, for much of this nation's history, the United States um, shaped its constitutional rights as absent from the everyday lives of Native people. The Supreme Court held in the 19th century that the Bill of Rights did not limit the power of Native nations, that the Reconstruction Amendments did not apply to Native peoples or Native nations, and that the Constitution provided no limit on the power of the national government to regulate every facet of Native life. To the extent that rights did play a role, it was largely in the furtherance of the American colonial project. During the reservation era, the United States dangled rights over Indian country like a carrot, promising to end the violence in exchange for Native land and sovereignty. If only Native people would relinquish, uh, relinquish citizenship in Native nations, surrender tribal land, and embrace the civilization of white communities, they could claim the protection of constitutional rights. Broadening the first reconstruction teaches us that a third reconstruction cannot presume that nationalism alone is a panacea for majority tyranny and should recognize also that rights can wound as well as shield racialized communities. Now turning to the second reconstruction, a broader view of this period also known as the civil rights era could expand the toolkit from which we draw in envisioning a third reconstruction to include empowerment alongside rights in the aim of ending the subordination of racialized communities. For example, the same period in Native American history is known as the self-determination era, or the era where Native advocates doubled down on their goal to shift power to their communities through a mass of statutes that recognize the ability of Native communities and Native nations to govern themselves. The self-determination era of Native people is often treated as wholly distinct from the civil rights era, and the modern struggles of other racialized and subordinated minorities to the extent uh, that it's treated at all. Given the fact that Native advocates were aiming to resolve similar forms of racism and subordination as other groups, it's a puzzle as to why. The work of Dakota political theorist Vine Deloria Jr., written contemporaneously to the civil rights area, sheds some light on this puzzle, puzzle of exclusion. According to Deloria, the civil rights movement had conflated the entirety of racialized injustice with a focus on civil rights. By contrast, Native advocates formed a, quote, power movement aimed at reclaiming homelands and the political and economic power sufficient to govern themselves. Native advocates viewed civil rights as limited reforms that promised only equality as sameness, Deloria noted, and legal equality and cultural conformity were identical. Rights, were not only a distraction for the movement, 
the integration and cultural conformity that they required were antithetical to the American Indian movement's goals of mutual respect with economic and political independence. Thus, despite the fact that Indian status was deeply racialized, racial hierarchies formed whatever heart imperialism has, the historical conflation of race with the struggle for civil rights has in certain respects divided the struggle for racial justice from the struggle against colonialism. In contrast to the civil rights era of the second reconstruction, the federal government has used the empowerment of native people to mitigate colonization and the subordination of native peoples rather than rights. Since 1934, with the passage of the Indian Reorganization Act, the United States has fostered the self-government of native nations, including the ratification of constitutions, recognition of the legitimacy of tribal courts, legislatures, and executive councils, and by supporting self-governance of Indian country by its own citizens and residents. Although the political branches have created a bevy of limitations on tribal sovereignty, largely in the context of criminal law, and the Supreme Court has ushered in even more restrictions, the sovereignty of Native nations remains. Native people continue to maintain a culture of sovereignty and organize with power as a central guiding principle. By contrast to movements organized around rights, organizing around power motivates Native people to build spaces of governance that help give shape to their daily lives. Many Native nations have assumed control wielded previously by the federal and state governments of hospitals, schools, courts, police forces, and other social services within tribal lands. Tribal governments deal directly with state and federal governments through compacts and agreements, and can represent the collective needs of their citizens, both in courts and before the Congress and the executive. Through the power of local governance, Native nations have begun language re uh, revitalization efforts, established highly successful business enterprises, fortified traditional forms of governance, and have become the laboratories of democracy to which the federalism of the, uh, the federal system of the United States aspires. Although many of these governments are built in the shadow of colonialism and reflect those limitations, some have allowed radical visions of community to take shape, including versions of democratic socialism, racial egalitarianism, and the rejection of white supremacy and restorative visions of criminal justice. However imperfect, the structure of federal Indian law has allowed Native nations to achieve and preserve the economic and political independence aspired to by Deloria and those within the American Indian movement. Empowering racialized communities to govern, uh, I argue, offers um, an yet another valuable constitutional, constitutional tool in crafting the Third Reconstruction, one potentially on par with the codification and enforcement of national constitutional rights. And Indian country, the inclusion of Indian country into this conversation teaches that majority minority governance is not so foreign to our democracy as some might presume. So I'll end there and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Maggie, and, and for offering us a different perspective on, on you know, the conversations about both the first and second reconstructions. Um, moving on to questions, I, you know, some of you have, have discussed this, uh, but I'm going to uh, ask it anyway. Um, it, if you were designing a third reconstruction, um, what would that look like to you and what would you want to, mo to most urgently address? Uh, and, and this is for, uh, you know, any of the guests on the panel, any and all. I pick up on Professor Frankie's point about the racial wealth gap. And I would want any third reconstruction to eliminate the racial wealth gap. And I would define success as no difference, zero difference. In fact, the outcome for Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Indigenous Americans, when they are equal to the outcome for white Americans, that's when the, the work would be done. Does anybody else want to weigh in here or I can move on to the other question. Ian, I think you're, uh, I think you're muted. <laughs> Not by choice. Sorry, I've done it a million times. <laughs> the power that be. <laughs> um, you, you know, I really want to come back. There's a, there's a, um, you know, a goals and a sort of a means conversation here. So, so if we think, well, what, a, what would a third reconstruction achieve? Then an answer like um, 
an, you know, an, an end to social economic correlates to racial categories. I mean, that's a dramatic answer, right? That's saying we're, we, we want a country in which race no longer corresponds to different positions in terms of economic um, um, uh, wealth, or I would say social status or cultural representation or, 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 or okay, so I like that as the end. How are we gonna get there? And here, Catherine, I hope you don't mind, but I, I wanna take issue with your proposed route because it's precisely the sort of route that I think guarantees we will never get there. So if I understood you correctly, you, you ended by saying, how about a renewed um, a, a state tax that then is channeled into funding reparations for black for for black communities and Native Americans? And now, combining that with Dorothy's comments, the state tax is going to fall disproportionately on white people because they're holding the disproportionate amount of of wealth in terms of um, uh, estates and property. Do you realistically think? this country is anywhere in the next 5, 10, 15, 30, 50 years going to enact a policy that is purposefully designed to transfer massive amounts of wealth from white people to black and native people. And, and, and the question is not, should it? I agree, it should. Will it, if it's framed that way? And so this is, this is, the, this is the point I'm trying to make. A lot of us are operating in frameworks in which we discuss racial justice as a, as a zero-sum conflict with whites. We need, we're, we're, we're engaged in a politics of promoting the idea that racial justice requires transferring things from whites to people of color. And I get that on a moral level, but I'm objecting to it on two different, my, my objections are twofold. One is, as a, as a practical strategy, it's doomed to fail and in fact makes the sort of slide away from democracy and towards authoritarianism more likely because it strengthens the right's preferred narrative that white people are threatened by demographic change and by calls for racial justice. And my second point is it actually blinds us. It blinkers our vision in terms of what racism is about, the function of racism today. The function of racism today is to promote the idea that we must fear our neighbors, that we're in competition with other racial groups. And when we subscribe to this idea, that's precisely the moment we give up on activists, we give up on each other, we give up on activist government, it produces two big outcomes on the economic side. It suggests to us that we're all on our own and that we have to trust the marketplace and those most successful in the marketplace, neoliberalism. And on the cultural side, it pushes people to buy guns. And now we're seeing that close to half of all American households are buying guns and people of color are entering into the gun buying market in, in newly high levels. Why? because more and more we've, we're coming to fear that, that we are going to descend into racial strife, right? And so this is the, this is the sort of like, okay, I, I, I share the goals. What's the most practical way to get there? And how does that connect with a broader vision of how racism has been weaponized against all of us? Ian, <laughs> It's so great. You know, I do a lot of public speaking about about reparations and I get called a lot of names by um, white people um, and a lot of folks who you know don't support the idea of reparations. But I've never been accused of um, supporting gun ownership and contributing to the epidemic of gun ownership and gun shootings in this country. So that's really a first. Thanks. Um, <laughs> And I, I like to think that your critique um, was more uh, ended up being broader than about the proposal that I made. It's it's it, 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 the proposal that I'm making offered you an uh, opportunity to revisit some of your ideas. Um, and I think this is a live uh, conversation that we've been having for a very long time is can we repair um, the violence of racism and white supremacy in this country without talking about race? Are there new ways to talk about race? And I know you, you don't think so. Um, I think- Those two are different. 
the no, new no. ways versus without talking about it. Let me finish and then we can let others jump in too. Um, I, and as I said in my remarks earlier, I think there's something sui generis about slavery. We have stopped talking about it. Um, and uh, and we, we, lock, we put it in a lockbox in our past uh, in ways that uh, exonerate those of us today who are the beneficiaries of a structure that included slavery, but not only. And so I feel like we have to talk not only about racism and race, but also about the privileges that white people enjoy um, by virtue of our race. And that's why I do this work. I wrote this book for white people that we need to confront the ways in which we innocently inherited money from our parents and they from their grandparents. And over time, those assets increased in value largely through real estate investments as, as Professor Brown was telling us earlier and in a game that black people never could really get in on um, for a whole sorts of very well-organized reasons. Um, uh, and until we take this on and take some responsibility for it as white people, it just can't be the work that only black people do of ringing that bell over and over again. And I think it's that's part of why that bell has not, um, a, the ringing of that bell has not brought us to a racial reckoning that we would have liked. So I, I think, you know, you're, you're a much more pragmatic person than I am, Ian, in some respects. Um, but I really believe deeply in dreaming the world I, uh, I, I want to have um, and having that be part of my politics. We were asked and charged in this panel to think about a third reconstruction, which is a project of imagining a different, a different future. And I, um, uh, to be told that it's too hard to do uh, uh, feels to me to be, um, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to go there. I also don't think we weren't talking about reparations five years ago, 10 years ago. This country wasn't. Of course, there were advocates in the black community who were, but we're now talking about it seriously. So there were to ha starting to have a conversation about race now that we have never had in this country. And that's largely due to the Black Lives Matter movement and work in the streets and the black community themselves. So let's not close the door too quickly. Is it okay if I jump in? Okay, thanks. Um, and so I, I, uh, I agree wholeheartedly again with Professor Frankie's comments and the idea that um, imagination is necessary to really answer the question of what a third reconstruction would look like. But I think that you don't need to imagine as much as we might think. Uh, if we expand the case studies from which we're drawing our facts of how uh, especially public funds have been redistributed to communities of color for historical injustice, especially state-sponsored violence over the last even few decades. So we take, for example, Tulsa. Um, you know, we are now seeing a wonderful focus um, uh, once again of a reckoning and remembrance of the Tulsa race massacre. Well, during the same period, there was um, the uh, violence enacted against the Osage Nation, exact same time period, which in 2011 resulted in a $380 million settlement by the United States government transferred to the Osage Nation. And that's really just one of many settlements that have transferred funds, massive amounts of funds directly from the national government to native nations. Uh, and that's largely because we have a legal framework that recognizes that historical injustice. We have treaties and violation of those treaties. We have a legal system that recognizes the trust responsibility of the national government and overseeing native resources. And we use those legal mechanisms, and we being Native advocates, use those legal <coughs> mechanisms to uh, garner settlements, not only just settlements, but also billions of dollars through federal funding when it comes to programming, because Native nations are treated like states. And, and so they're able to get funding that other state governments get. That's not, quote, reparations, but I think we need to have a broader conversation about what money transfers and land transfers, especially land transfers, if you're talking about Indian country, really look like. Um, and what a broader vision of what a third reconstruction would look like, given the not just the idea of that imagination, but the reality of how our country is currently operating with respect to historical injustice and racialized communities. We take Native people off the table. We consider it sui generis, and I think that might be because it's working. Um, and we don't want to have it work for 
other people. But I think the story that it wouldn't work and that it's politically untenable, maybe if people start paying attention to it, uh, they might see it as now politically untenable. But if you actually look at the historical facts, modern historical facts of how funds have been distributed, how land has been distributed, you have a land back movement that's actually transferring cities or transferring land from their jurisdiction to Native nations, um, independent of any kind of force uh, by the national government. They just see it as right to do. Um, so you're having this happen over time. I guess I just don't see that argument that it's not possible at all because it's happening, at least in the Native context. And so we should maybe have a conversation about why that's not generalizable, but I, I think uh, it might be. Um, and, and it might help to expand our uh, the power of our imagination to imagine something different moving forward if we really look at what the reality is right now. So I wanted to follow up and say, I wanna thank Ian for being on this panel because he is making me look optimistic. And I like never get accused of being optimistic. <laughs> so his, neg his negative framing is like, oh, I'm not that. So I also wanna point out um, an Emory colleague of mine, uh, Drew Weston wrote a book years ago called The Political Brain. And he makes the argument in the book that Republicans are just much better at framing than Democrats. Republicans come out with a story that touches your heart and Democrats come out with a 10 point plan, right? So getting back to Professor Frankie's point about the estate tax, oh yeah, we can take it down. Why? Because at this point, there's like several hundred people who are subject to it and nobody else. So we don't even have, we could take like every third person and win this fight, but it is a matter of framing. And I do think, you know, what I pick up from what Ian is saying is it's really important to think about framing, but I don't think a lot of work has been put in by white Americans, as Professor Frankie is saying, to think about the framing and how to frame it. And I don't think there's just a lot of work that's been put in on how, because I've talked with my colleague, Drew Weston, who does focus groups and tells me how you message race to white Americans. So there is absolutely a way to do it. Um, it's just something that we have to be thoughtful about. And I don't think there's a lot of time spent thinking about and focus grouping, I'm now making up words, how to, take a message that will resonate. And I look at the support for Black Lives Matter over time. And yeah, there's been some recent research that showed um, the high of the summer has waned some, but it's still significantly higher than it was a few years ago. And a few years ago, if, if someone had said, do you ever think a majority of the country will support Black Lives Matter? Actually, I'm sure there was a panel somewhere, somebody asked that and the answer was, oh no, it'll never happen. So, you know, I have to believe that this is gonna lead somewhere if we are careful about our approach. So yes, Ian, you are making me out myself as an optimist when I am not normally an optimist. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. Uh, let, me, let me clarify my remarks. What I'm saying is, I think there is a route to get to reparations. I think there is a route to build political power and to bring government back on the side of most Americans and to take it out of the grips of the economic titans and the corporations. But that route requires a reimagination, an act of reimagination about how race is working, about how division is working, and about what a politics of repair looks like. And what, so this is a, this is, I'm making both an analytic point and also a point about what this analysis implies about a theory of social change. So I think what a lot of people are hearing is my critique of the extant theory of social change and my critique of the extant theory of social change, which some of you are continuing to advance is really the critique that Derek Bell made, which is interest convergence. Hey, it's great to talk about what morality demands, 
that's unlikely to produce significant support for, for social change. Some exceptional um, 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 uh, counterexamples notwithstanding, we are very unlikely to build a supermajority of, of voters who support a, a model that says we must redistribute wealth, power, and status from whites to people of color. That's very unlikely to happen if the argument is based on morality. But don't stop there. What I'm saying is reconsider how race is actually working and what that implies for a different route towards social change. Race is not simply and indeed not primarily a dynamic of whites against people of color. It has always been and it remains today, primarily, fundamentally at root, a strategic weapon in the hands of people with ulterior motives. Those other people are typically economic elites. They need not be. If you think about westward expansion and whites mobilizing race as a basis for claiming the legitimacy of dispossession Native Americans, poor and working class whites are also able for their ulterior ends to mobilize racial rhetoric. Nevertheless, let's look at those ulterior ends and understand how they're working. And if that's our analysis, and I think it's a really important analysis because it gives us a much better grasp on what's happened to us since the civil rights movement, what's happened to the Republican Party, what's happened to wealth redistribution the, uh, into the stratosphere, what's happened in terms of state violence against communities of color. If that's the analysis, then it also suggests a different theory of social change. And it's the theory of social change that says, when we can show people that each and every one of us is under a dire threat from anti-black racism, and it doesn't matter if we're black, it could be white or brown or red or yellow, the most dire threat to each of our families comes from anti-black racism and its political weaponization. When we can show people that, the response is, then let's build power across racial lines. Let us actively repudiate anti-black racism and build a movement across racial solidarity. And what does that require? Racial egalitarianism and racial repair. So there is a sort of, there is an optimism that says there is a route that we can take. And this too, I think, is, is consonant with Derek Bell's interest convergence. Although it pivots away from Bell by saying there is an interest we can identify for people so that they do have a pragmatic sense that they have skin in the game in fighting racism and active, actively building power across race, race lines, whether or not they're black or brown or Native American. Right? That's the move. And so Catherine, did, you know, sort of come back to you. This isn't critique for the sake of critique. This is like deep and respectful engagement with the work you're doing, but also saying, I share your goals. I'm really worried that, that we can't get there without shifting our analysis and then shifting the way we frame why we should move there together. Just last thought on this. I'm, I'm also reading the comments that the viewers are submitting. And um, I would ask you, Ian, to perhaps enjoy a kind of humility about how right you may be, because I am humble about how right I am. Uh, and Callie Mama 1962 is urging a position that I also agree with is that we need to do all of this. I'm not gonna stop talking about the immorality of slavery and racism. The moral argument is hugely important and you can do your more tactical um, uh, third way uh, advocacy, um, um, but I'm not sure which of us is right, but I'm glad I live in a world where you're doing what you're doing, and I hope you're glad you live in a world where I'm talking about race and racism and white supremacy and colonialism the way I am as a moral matter. And I, I think if we're not doing all of this, then we're, um, uh, we're being unwise. So I swear I, I did not... Oh, I, sorry, go ahead, Ian. If I could just, so, so, so Catherine, I, I both agree with you, I, I agree with you, but with one important caveat. As we choose our, our routes, our commitments, our scholarship, the things we say in public, we should do so kind of in this sort of self-critically with a sense of the range of different, the range of different ways of talking and with a sense of the larger racial dynamics in which we're trying to intervene. And perhaps you're deeply familiar with this. 
Many people are not. Many people are drawing on what I'm terming a white racism frame as an unexamined paradigm. I don't mind if somebody says, I've surfaced it, I've thought about it, this is the paradigm I want to lean into, but to do so purposefully and thoughtfully rather than as a taken for granted paradigm. And listen, just to, just to put myself in it, this is the paradigm that I long operated in without thinking about it critically. Right? And so I, I, I do think that that is, a, that is an important dynamic, but you're absolutely right. I completely share your point of view. Many routes to the mountaintop, happy to encourage them all. So I actually, I wrote down this question before uh, this, uh, the panel took this direction, but, but I think it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's relevant. Uh, you know, uh, reconstruction, the original reconstruction was a seminal moment for black rights, but it also led to greater, greater freedom for poor white people, as, and especially in places like Virginia, uh, there was a lot of cooperation between white and black working people um, you know, that staved off, I mean, in Virginia in particular, it staved off the reimposition of white supremacy longer than almost every other state. Um, how should a third reconstruction approach that particular issue? And I know, Ian, you have thoughts on that, but, but you know, this is obviously a question for uh, uh, other panelists as well. Here, let, let me just say very quickly, something like the new poor people's movement. And I'll just lift that up as an example. Let me also lift up um, so a, a lot of these ideas that I'm putting forward. I've tried to make accessible and tried to break them down into sort of like a bit by bit uh, curriculum called, and I put it, and it's online. It's, you know, free to the public. It's called raceclassacademy.com. Um, but I'd invoke the poor people's movement. I'd also invoke uh, people's action another fantastic group doing grassroots organizing. That's the, this is the core insight. The strategy on the right is to sow social strife and conflict. We need to be careful that the primary message coming from the left is a renewed commitment to social solidarity that is not colorblind at all but is expressly and centrally anti-racist. And also just to bring in these other culture war divisions that also helps us understand the context for the, the renewed attacks on abortion, the renewed attack on trans rights, um, some of the rhetoric around Native American people, right? Like we need to bring all of these in together. Do we have time for more? I couldn't, there was a bit of a flag on the time. Uh, yeah, we, uh, Maggie, why don't you go ahead and then we'll, we'll uh, include this question that we got from the audience and then we'll see where we are. Well, just build um, uh, upon some comments that were made about there might be just multiple solutions to uh, the problem of social and legal change. Um, I'd like to add to that complexity a little bit um, uh, an essay that I'm publishing shortly addresses the Supreme Court's decision, uh, recent decision in McGirt v. Oklahoma, which was the case uh, where the Supreme Court held that, or the result would be that one third to one half of the state of Oklahoma exists within an Indian reservation, including large swaths of Tulsa. Um, so in that essay, I ask uh, scholars to begin to include power movement strategies within their study of social and legal change, because if you look at the strategy of native peoples as a power movement and many other power movements likely, but native people in particular in that essay, they don't focus on changing the dominant ideology of the broader society uh, in accomplishing legal change. Instead, they focus on formal lawmaking institutions. And so in having a conversation about how to allocate resources moving forward, of course, uh, when facing the public, we need to understand the work of dominant ideology, the entrenchment of power that it uh, re-entrenches over time, regardless of our reform efforts. But I think that understanding Indian country and the history of Native advocacy also teaches that we can also uh, allocate our time and energy as legal scholars, as law students, as reformers on changing the law. Um, and advocating to those legal institutions and trying to undermine the power of that dominant ideology, even if um, it's held by uh, white people, if it's not held by white people, if it includes a narrative of white racism, if it doesn't, 
Um, but we can instead focus our efforts on really trying to change the law and formal legal institutions and shifting power to our communities rather than trying to change the way other people think. Uh, and then that is not a precondition to social and legal change. And that's not necessarily a precondition for a third reconstruction. Um, so that was the even more nuanced, um, not to be an academic about it, but an even more nuanced view of, of what we can do moving forward. So academics can not only just face the public, but we can do more within those formal legal institutions to change them, make them more accessible to um, racialized minority advocacy and otherwise. Uh, thank you so much for that, Maggie. I'm sorry to say uh, we have to wrap up the panel. I wish we could keep going. I, I'm, uh, I've been enjoying the conversation with all of you. Um, as far as the CLE credit, uh, the second and final co code for today's panel is change 15, which you can also find displayed at the bottom of the screen. As a reminder, you'll need this code and the code I provided earlier to qualify for CLE credit. Use the link posted in the chat box, which will take you to the form that you have to fill out. Um, thank you so much to our panelists. This was a wonderful discussion. Um, your books all sound amazing. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna hand things off to Lindsay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Adam and our panelists for such a fantastic conversation. Um, I feel like I learned so much and I know that it will certainly inform our work here at ACS going forward. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us. I encourage you to attend this evening's Member of Color Mixer. It begins at 6 p.m. Eastern. All are welcome. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow afternoon for our next panel discussion, Advancing an Anti-Entrenchment Agenda, How to Save Our Democracy by Deconcentrating Wealth and Power. So please tune in. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you for the rest of the week.